Okay, thanks for being here. I shall assume that everybody in the lecture hall has purposefully chosen to sit here. I would just invite you to think about at the end whether you want to applaud. I hardly do know anybody here, otherwise I probably wouldn't do that talk. However, it's important for me that you don't misunderstand this as a personal insult. So, let's start from the beginning. Why did nature invent spin after all? And uh, the answer is nobody knows. We're not talking about describing the, uh, by the Dirac equation. The question is why nature did not allow to do physics without that feature. So if you don't understand the deeper reason of spin, obviously we do not understand the deeper reason of uh, why we have fermions and bosons. And that's kind of strange of postulating uh, a symmetry uh, between these particles, because there might be a good reason why nature has chosen that there is no symmetry. And it's also kind of strange to imagine how a superatom atom would be composed of its superparticles, bosonic parts. Well, in any case, uh, what symmetry we are talking about? I mean, symmetries in fundamental laws of physics have been linked by Emmy Noether, the mathematician, and it's certainly uh, an interesting and deep idea to relate symmetries and conserved quantities, but this is related to reality as long as we talk about space and time, okay? And physics has developed a lot of concepts that do not have any relation to reality anymore. I'll just give you an example, uh, strangeness. Nobody understands beta decay. So this ignorance is kind of vested in the term, oh, that's weak interaction. And if that idea of weak interaction then contradicts with the idea of strong interaction, we call that contradiction strangeness. And now this strangeness is taken as an axis in an imaginary space, and you're going to rotate objects and postulate symmetries. But that's a complete metaphorical concept, and uh, taking that as Treating that like a, a real space is walking into fantasy land. And some people justifiably called it like this. Richard Feynman was a little bit outspoken. SO3 times SO2 times O1, where does it go together? Only if you add stuff that we don't know. There isn't any theory today that has any of that, whatever the hell that is, that we know it's right that has any experimental check. Now these guys are trying to put this together. They're trying to, but they haven't, okay? So I don't know, you might be, instead of that group, you might be a fan of SO5 or something. I think that's a superficial kind of dull idea, but that's not the basic problem. Um, the basic problem is this, I mean, Supersymmetry from the outset should be kind of an intellectual approach to physics. But look at this standard model. It's a messy patchwork that obviously is too complicated to be credible. And before you start now arguing that, oh, it's so wonderfully experimentally tested, I shall remind you of the seven deadly sins of particle physics. The standard model is hilariously complicated. Good physics is simple. All the real breakthroughs in physics have simplified a lot of uh, the laws of physics. They haven't added these complicated parameters. We have a suppression of basic problems. I shall go to the details in the next slide. I think there is a lot of histor historical ignorance about the methods of physics. I think there is uh, there is always a signal illusion. Physicists are kind of fooling themselves with very tiny signals. 
they're going to interpret. There is a lot of theoretical wishful thinking along the concepts I named before, these metaphorical labels like isospin and hypercharge and strangeness and whatever it is. There is certainly a lot of parroting and groupthink in the community. And there is a total lack of, of transparency when you go to the raw data. So I shall just name you uh, some unsolved problems. You can't compute masses. Taken as example, Paul Dirac, he pondered for years of his life uh, about the mass ratio of, of proton and electron. And he was putting all his intellect and all his efforts into this question. He would be disgusted about the idea explaining it with a symmetry breaking or something like that. That's, that's a cheap excuse. So the standard model can compute masses. It cannot compute mass ratios. It cannot compute lifetimes. It cannot compute the fine structure constant. It cannot explain the infinities in electrodynamics. There are serious contradictions. It says nothing about the origin of gravity. It says nothing about the origin of antimatter. It can't tell you why we need spin. It says nothing about the origin of radioactivity, about the nature of space, time, and inertia. A model of physics which has nothing to say about all these fundamental questions is crap. And that's where supersymmetry is built upon. So David Lindley, a distinguished critic of physics, says this method in particle physics is becoming the rule for explaining every seeming distinction. Turn it into a perfect symmetry improperly realized. He was talking about the so-called explanations of antimatter. This, um, I mean, what does that mean, symmetry breaking after all, right? It's an asymmetric isometry, a pregnant virgin, or uh, swimming in the dry, I don't know. God created everything by number, weight, and measure, and these are the things a physicist ought to predict. We don't have to worry about fancy stuff like strangeness, just predict a couple of numbers. That's you, what you're supposed to do as a physicist. And as a sideline, there is no astrophysical evidence for supersymmetric particles whatsoever. A very good book about the dark matter problem by Robert Saunders, a Dutch astronomer, he's saying that physicists don't know the, uh, know that the rotation curves are flat of galaxies. They don't know anything about the regularity of rotation curves or global scale relations and aren't very interested in learning about them. And he also says the real problem is that dark matter is not falsifiable. The ingenuity and imagination of theoretical physicists can always accommodate any astronomical non-detection by inventing new possible dark matter candidates. And I think here we come to the point where the idea of supersymmetry is even worse than the standard model because it squeezes out of falsifiability. This is what Richard Feynman said about the early attempts. Somebody makes up a theory, the proton is unstable, they make up a calculation and find that there would be no more protons in the universe anymore. <laughs> So they fiddle around with their numbers, putting a higher mass into the new particle, and after much effort they predict that the proton will decay at a rate slightly less than the last measured rate the proton has shown not to decay yet. When a new experiment comes along and measures the proton more carefully, the theories adjust themselves to squeeze out from the pressure. And that's what happens. The predictions squeeze out of falsifiability David Lindley again comments, ironically, scientists are not inclined to pause and reflect at the demise of a once bright idea. The idea of recovery is to move as quickly as possible to the next bright idea. By the way, Lindley gives a very nice account of the history of supersymmetry. I think the first experimental death was as early as here in 1978, so we're kind of the 40th anniversary here. And uh, in 2010, David Gross, for example, explained that supersymmetry would have a serious problem if it wouldn't show up at the LHC data. But, I mean, Gross is now just replaced by another 
couple of bright upcoming physicists that will go to higher energies. This is Peter Voigt's blog, not even wrong. I mean, Peter Voigt is a bogus believer in many uh, respects, but he gets this quite right. He pointed to these predictions of uh, Profumo di Susi, 610 giga electron volts, it's called Aroma and the sweet fragrance of Susi. And he really says it's easy to extrapolate what these authors will be claiming the Susi masses are, harder to extrapolate how they will be describing the smell. There is a very distinct critic of uh, science, and I think this is really applies to that case, and he calls zombie science. Zombie science is science that is dead but will not lie down. It is animated and moved only by incessant pumping of funds. Classical theory has it that the bogus hypothesis will be rejected when it fails to predict reality, but such a catastrophe can be deferred almost infinitely by the elaboration of secondary hypotheses to explain why not fitting the fact facts is not, after all, fatal to the theory. Well, I will not say here today that supersymmetry will not be vindicated. I think there will be the day Peter Voigt will stop blogging and the reason is there is always a signal illusion. Particle physicists for decades have built up new accelerators, have looked at anomalies, have declared them to be new particles, have removed them as a background and now are looking for the next tiny tiny signal. So they are fooling themselves with excessive filtering, triggering and background removal that necessarily lead to detections of poorly specified signals. That's a never-ending story. And so I will make one prediction. After carefully removing the background of all known signals, someday in some accelerator at some high energy, some tiny signal will be discovered for which the only reasonable explanation is a hint clue or smoking gun for an axino, gluino, fotino, foteto, fotuzzo, foticello. There is an open end of Italian diminutives. And well, to conclude, I shall like to dedicate this talk to Ludwig Wittgenstein I like very much. My advice would be, if you're young enough, try to get out of this business simply because there is no guarantee that society will fund that kind of bogus science forever. For possible questions, I can recommend very good books by David Lindley, by Gary Tobbs, in particular Andrew Pickering. And if you're interested in more details of my methodological and and a historical critique of physics, there is Bankrupting Physics at Macmillan, which is a translation of that science book of the year in 2010. And this is more about cosmology, this is a little bit more about the rest of particle physics, and a part of this is a critique of particle physics called the Higgs phase that largely applies also to supersymmetry. And my last book is about, well, to be constructive about some interesting ideas about cosmology. Thank you for your extraordinary patience. I welcome any comments. <laughs>